Thank you, Miss Calver, for bringing us to the science rooms. My name is Miss Brown. I'm one of the science teachers here at Holy Cross Catholic High School. So in science, when you start in year seven, we have biology, chemistry, and physics. So that's three sciences that we learn. We've got eight science labs, and today we're going to do four experiments and including one that you can have a little go at at home before you arrive here in September. So our first experiment is going to be the flame test. So I'm going to show you how to do it, demonstrate what it involves, and talk to you about the metals and the different colours in fireworks. Okay, so we're at our first experiment, which is the flame test. So we're going to learn about the chemistry of different fireworks and why they have different colours. You'll notice I've put on my safety goggles to make sure that I don't get in any danger. And I'm going to change my flame from the yellow flame to the blue flame, which is what we use for experiments in science. Now, the reason that we have different colours in fireworks is because they contain different metals, and certain metals will give off energy more than others, which is why they, when they give off energy, give it in the form of light and different colours. So our first salt that we're going to look at is copper sulphate. I'm going to put my loop into the copper sulphate, I'm going to then put it over the flame, and we'll see a nice green flame. So this is the color that copper metals go. So when you see a firework and it's green, it contains copper salts. And we can repeat that again. I'm now going to clean my loop and put it in some hydrochloric acid. And I'm now going to test lithium carbonate salt. So when the loop goes into the salt powder, and on a firework, this would normally be mixed with gunpowder to create the combustion and the ignition and put it into my flame. This one is going red. So whenever we see a red firework, it may contain lithium salts. Moving on to our next demonstration, we're going for sodium chloride. Now sodium chloride, you'll know is salt. So you might put this onto your fish and chips at home. But the sodium metal, when it gets heat and excited, will cause the electrons to jump into new energy shells and actually that's unstable so the electrons move back down and that's when they give off the light and the colour. So I dip my loop into the sodium chloride and we've got a nice bright orange flame that's now being seen from the sodium metal salts. Going to clean that into my hydrochloric acid and this time we're testing barium chloride, also another metal in group two on the periodic table. So we'll put our loop back into the barium salts, put on the Bunsen burner, and again we've got an orange flame. So both sodium and barium go orange in the metal coloured of flames. And for our final two flames, we're going to look at potassium chloride. So potassium is a group 1 metal and it's quite reactive. It should produce a nice coloured flame which is lilac. So it is looking a little bit like orange sodium and barium at the moment. There may be some excess metal so I'm just going to give it another clean and dip my loop back in. So we're looking for a lilac coloured flame with a little bit of orange too. And for our final metal, we are going to do calcium. So this is some calcium sulphate. I'm going to dip my metal loop into the calcium sulphate metal. And remember, this is being heated. The electrons would form different colours and we should see an orange flame again. So this tells us that it's quite hard to tell the difference between a calcium metal, a barium metal and a sodium metal from each other. Hopefully you've enjoyed this experiment. So what I would now like you to do is using the email address below on this screen, I would like you to design your own firework using the different metals and give the different colours of names of salts that you would put into your firework. We look forward to seeing your pictures. Following on from the flame experiment, we're now going to look at that at a little bit more detail. So what I'm going to do is put the metal salts for copper sulphate and for lithium carbonate into two petri dishes. And this time I'm going to put some methanol over them. 
Now, methanol is an alcohol and it's highly flammable. So when we light it using the flame from the Bunsen burner, we should get a nice big flame that's being exerted with the different colours for the copper, which we saw as being green, and for the lithium, which we saw as being red. So I'm now going to put my pipette into the methanol and I'm just going to sprinkle the methanol over the metal salts in the Petri dishes. A generous helping of methanol should produce a nice clear flame. Now remember, because methanol is very flammable, it must be done in a science lab, so it's safe for the teacher to take part in. And I'm now going to use my splint to light the flames. So I'm going to take a piece of my Bunsen burner. I'm now going to light the splint and I'm just going to put it in and around the Petri dish. Now, because of the fact it's hot and it's a flame, the methanol is highly flammable, it will ignite. And we should now be able to see the nice green colour of the copper and the red colour of the lithium starting to come through. Now, if we remember, fireworks have different colours because the electrons inside the metals get excited when the metal reacts with the gunpowder and it creates an ignition, the heat given off causes the electrons to get excited, that's not very stable, so they jump back down into the non-excited state and releasing that energy is in the form of light. And because our eyes can see the visible region, we can see different colours. So the reason we have different colours is because different metals drop down to different levels. We're now going to be testing for different gases. We're going to do some experiments that are going to test for oxygen gas and for hydrogen gas. Now the first experiment we're going to do is a reaction of hydrochloric acid. This is two molar, so it's quite concentrated. And we're going to react it with magnesium powder. Now for this experiment, we're going to use a pipette again to put some of the hydrochloric acid into a boiling tube. Now, the hydrochloric acid, as I've mentioned, is two molar, so that's quite corrosive, which means that it can cause burns to the skin if you were to come into contact. I've now put my hydrochloric acid into my boiling tube, and I'm going to use a spatula to add in magnesium powder. Now, the magnesium powder, we don't need a lot of it. When we put it into the boiling tube, a reaction will take place between the magnesium and the hydrochloric acid. This will make a substance called magnesium chloride, but it will also produce a gas called hydrogen. Now, when I put the magnesium into the hydrochloric acid, I'm going to cover the top. Now, you'll notice that this is to prevent any of the hydrogen gas escaping. When the reaction takes place, you will see some fizzing because hydrogen gas is being produced. It will also feel the test tube going hot. And that's because an exothermic reaction has taken place, which means that heat is being released to the surroundings. For this experiment, I'm now going to test the hydrogen gas. So I'm going to put the boiling tube back in, very quickly swap hands to prevent any hydrogen escaping, and I'm going to light a splint using the Bunsen burner. The test for hydrogen is the squeaky pop test. So when I put this lit splint into the roof of the boiling tube, what I should see is a squeaky pop, and you will hear it too. That was the squeaky pop that we should have exhibited. Maybe not as loud as we'd like, so we'll have another little go later in a bigger test tube in order to try and get the reaction to take place. So I'm going to repeat the experiment, but this time I'm going to try it in a conical flask in order to try and get as much hydrogen gas as possible so we get a big squeak. So again, I'm going to use the pipette to pour my hydrochloric acid into my conical flask. I'm now going to add the magnesium ribbon again whilst making sure my hand's over the top to ensure that no gas is escaping. So we don't want to put too much magnesium in because that will give us a really big reaction. So a small amount of magnesium. And I can already feel the pressure that's building up from the reaction. It's fizzing, which again tells us the hydrogen gas is being released. And it's getting hot, which tells us it's an exothermic reaction. The reaction is giving off heat. Now collecting my hydrogen gas, I'm going to try and get another squeaky pop, but this time a little bit louder. There we go. 
We're now going to test for oxygen gas using hydrogen peroxide. Now in this reaction, hydrogen peroxide decomposes, which means that it breaks down to form oxygen and water. Again, we want to make sure that we try and collect the oxygen and we're going to do a separate test to see whether oxygen has been produced. So I'm going to use a boiling tube. I'm going to pipette my hydrogen peroxide into the boiling tube. And then I'm going to add something called manganese oxide powder. Now the manganese oxide acts as a catalyst, which means that it makes the reaction go quicker so that we should get oxygen gas rather than waiting for a long time for the reaction to take place. So I've now put into my boiling tube some hydrogen peroxide. I'm now going to use a spatula again to add in manganese and I'm going to put a spatula into the boiling tube. Again, I'm going to put my hand over the top. There is some fizzing taking place, which again tells us that a gas is being produced, but this time it isn't the hydrogen gas that we saw in the first experiment. This time it's oxygen gas, and there is a different test for oxygen. So I'm going to put that into the test tube rack. I'm going to get another splint and light it with a Bunsen burner. Now for this test, rather than use the lit splint, we need to use a glowing splint. So that means that we need to blow this flame out. We then need to put this into the tip of the boiling tube. And what we should find is that the splint relights. The splint has relit, which tells us that oxygen is present. So what we're going to do now is test for different acids and alkalis that you have around your house. I'm going to model this experiment using Universal Indicator, which is a substance that we have here at Holy Cross in school. But then I'm going to show you how to use red cabbage at home to create your own indicator, where you can then go around your house testing different household liquids, items, for whether they are acidic or whether they are alkaline. So for our first bit, I'm going to show you about how we test in school for acids and alkalis. And for this, we use that substance called Universal Indicator, which I previously mentioned. Now, I've got a different variety of things you might find around the house, and I'm going to test them and see whether they are acid or whether they are alkaline. So, using these household items, we can use the pH scale to decide whether something is an acid, whether that's strong or a weak acid, whether it's neutral, which means it's neither an acid or an alkali, or whether something is an alkali, which means it would be dark greens, blues, and possibly purple. Now, we're going to start off this experiment by using baking powder. So you might find this in your parents' or guardian's kitchen cupboards. I'm going to use a spatula to collect a small amount of baking powder and put it onto my spotting tile. What I can then do is add the universal indicator I can put this onto the baking powder and it will go a colour. Now depending on what colour it goes, we can match to the pH scale, which will then tell us whether something is likely to be an alkaline, neutral or an acid. So it looks like baking powder here might be quite alkaline. We're now going to test our second compound, which is hydrochloric acid. I'm going to use a pipette to put the hydrochloric acid in as it's a liquid and rather than pour, it's easier. Put my hydrochloric acid into my spotting tile and again test with the indicator. Now the clue's in the name for hydrochloric acid. It is in fact an acid and it's a very strong acid which means that it's corrosive and it can cause burns to skin. You can see here that the colour red is being shown as pH 1 which again tells you something is very acidic. You can continue this experiment by using Colgate, some, some toothpaste. We can use some vinegar at home. Now, vinegar is made of acetic acid, and acetic acid, again, like hydrochloric acid, tells us this is an acid. However, we use this at home. We use it in cooking. We put it on our fish and chips. I've just told you that acids can be corrosive. So the question is, well, why can we consume this acid and it doesn't burn us? And that's because when I test it, it's actually gone to a lighter red colour, which tells us that it's a weak acid. So even though it's acidic, it isn't going to harm you if you was to consume the vinegar. Along with the toothpaste, we could do lemon juice. 
and that's another appliance or item you could use. We could also test with sodium hydroxide. This is something we use in school, but bleach could be quite similar. And we can also test bath salts. So you can see that there's many different items that you have at home that you can do these tests with to find out whether something is an acid or an alkali. And what we're going to do next is create your own indicator at home. So rather than the universal indicator, you use the red cabbage in order to build it yourself. So what we've got here is the red cabbage. I've bought this from Morrison's, but you can buy it from any supermarket. And I've actually just cut a little bit using a knife. Now, if you're doing this at home, you might want to ask your parents or guardians if they can cut it for you. Once you've got a small piece of the red cabbage, you need to use the scissors or the knife to cut it and chop it roughly into smaller pieces. So I'm using the knife, I'm cutting the red cabbage, just a small amount is what's necessary. And again, you can use scissors should you prefer. Please be very careful if you are using a knife at home and make sure that your fingers are out of the way at all times. I've now got my red cabbage and I've roughly chopped it into smaller pieces. I'm going to put this into what we call at school a pestle and mortar. However, a bowl at home will be just fine. I'm going to pour some of my cabbage into the pestle and then use the mortar later to grind it up. Now going to use some water which I've boiled in a kettle to pour into the red cabbage. The red cabbage has a natural indicator that's inside of it, but that's in the juices which we extract from the red cabbage rather than it being a solid. Now you can do this at home by putting the red cabbage into a pan and boiling it with water on the hob. However, you can also do it this way by using a kettle. I've already heated this kettle so it's very warm and I'm going to pour the water into my pestle and mortar. What you will see straight away is some of the juices leaving the red cabbage, in this case they're blue in colour. I'm gently going to grind this red cabbage up because now the water is making it soft so it should be nice and easy to extract that natural indicator that lies in the red cabbage. If you are doing this at home and you're using a pan, you will want to leave it to boil for around five minutes so that again, it has time for the juices to be extracted from. Once you've done this, you want to strain it and you want to then let it cool. I'm going to use the strainer in our labs, which is also a filter paper and funnel. You may wish to use a sieve at home, it will work in the same way. All it's doing is removing the large pieces of cabbage from the natural indicator itself. Just remove those. So, I'm now going to filter this using my filter paper and funnel. If you do have access to these at home, you need to fold the filter paper in half, fold it into a quarter, and then you can open it up with three on one side and one on the other. Going to put that into my funnel, and what I'm going to do is actually strain my liquid. So I should, oopsie, find my liquid coming through the filter paper into my large beaker. What you'll notice is that there's no red cabbage which is coming through at this moment in time. If I was to use some red cabbage and pop it in, it wouldn't go through the filter paper because it's simply too big. The filter paper only allows very small particles and molecules to get through. And you can see that I'm collecting my indicator, which should be roughly purple in colour in my beaker. I've now managed to get my filtrate, which is my universal indicator, into my large beaker and I'm just going to put it into a smaller beaker. You can do this with a cup at home just to make sure that it's easy for me to use. I'm going to actually now remove my filter paper from my funnel and I'm going to put that into my old discarded cabbage. I've now got my red cabbage indicator in the beaker or cup, whichever you have chosen to do. What I'm now going to do is test some items that you might find around the house to see whether they are acid and alkali. For the red cabbage indicator, it doesn't quite match up to the original pH scale that I showed you before. 
What you will now see on the screen is a red cabbage indicator pH scale so you can see whether your appliances are acid or alkaline. I'm going to test the lemon juice first, so I'm going to take the cap off the lemon juice. It's usually quite uh, sweet and quite sour. I'm going to put it into my spotting tiles and I'm going to use a pipette in order to extract some of my red cabbage indicator and test it. Now you'll notice from your screens that a weak acid will go pink in colour and that's what lemon juice is, a weak acid. It's not going to be painful, it's not going to burn or hurt you, however it is very acidic in taste. I'm now going to test the sodium hydroxide. You might like to try bleach at home, making sure that you've got an adult present whilst you are doing this experiment. I'm going to use my pipette to get some sodium hydroxide, put it into my spotting tile, and using my indicator I'm going to see whether it's an acid or an alkaline. In this case it's gone green, roughly that is pH 10 to 11 on the red cabbage indicator scale so you'll notice that this is quite alkaline and when you try bleach at home that should also go alkaline in colour. There are some other substances you may wish to try, for example washing up liquid, the vinegar from before or maybe some foods that are in your kitchen, soap, shampoos, conditioner, really you can do this with anything. But make sure that you're looking at the screen which tells you whether it's an acid or an alkali and we hope that you enjoy this. Please do put any videos or pictures of you performing this experiment and send to our email address below. So for our final experiment I'm going to do a demonstration on Mrs Moss. What I'm going to do is set her hand on fire. For this experiment we're going to call it methane bubbles. Now you definitely cannot do this experiment at home you must not try this, it needs to be done by a trained chemist in a science lab. So what I'm going to do is firstly add some water to a tray. After I've added the water to a tray, I'm then going to add some washing up liquid, I'm going to bubble through some methane gas from our gas taps in school, and we're going to actually ignite the methane bubbles which will create a fire-like result. The reason that I'm adding the water and the washing up liquid is because it's really important that we don't burn Mrs Moss when this reaction is taking place. It is a fire which means that it's going to give off lots of heat in again an exothermic reaction like the magnesium and hydrochloric acid reaction but it should not harm her in any way. Once I've got my tray I'm now going to add washing up liquid. Remember the washing up liquid is to prevent any harm going to Mrs Moss. I'm going to bubble through some methane gas from the taps. Now at school you may have learnt that when you have a gas, when you have heat and oxygen, a combustion reaction will take place and this will result in a fire being able to react. I'm going to mix the washing up liquid and the water together. You'll notice that the methane gas will produce bubbles. The bubbles on Mrs Moss's hand will actually move quite quickly because methane gas is less dense than water which means that the gas is going to rise from the water as we can see here. Now we're only using a small amount of methane here which is why this isn't going to cause any harm to Mrs Moss although when we've got heat, oxygen and gas we will see a fire being taken place. I've now put enough of the methane into my tray. What I'm going to ask Mrs Moss to do is to put her hands into the tray, making sure she's got some of the washing up liquid and water at the palms of her hand and also just past the wrist, whilst I light my splint on my meter ruler. Mrs Moss. So Mrs Moss if you just collect a small amount of methane bubbles and hold that in front of you please. Thank you and at a safe distance I'm now going to light the methane bubbles and there you have it the methane bubbles experiment. Mrs Moss are you okay? I'm fine thank you. Thank you very much. So I really hope that today you've found some of the experiments that we do at Holy Cross exciting and you're really eager to start in September. 
All of these chemistry experiments are ones that you will see during your time here at Holy Cross, particularly in Year 7 when you start in this coming September. There are obviously lots of other experiments, including biology and physics experiments that we do, where we'll go outside, we'll look at animal adaptations, plant adaptations, and we also have a very large greenhouse where we go outside and do some land-based science. We're really looking forward to seeing you here in September at Holy Cross, and for me and all the science staff, See you soon.